And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast, live from a windowless studio in New York City, where I am so excited. I am almost pulsating with excitement. I don't even know where to start, because in studio with me is Sam Anderson, the author of, among many other things, but the thing we're going to talk about today, a book called Boomtown, The Fantastical Saga of Oklahoma City. It's chaotic founding, it's apocalyptic weather, it's purloined basketball team, and the dream of becoming a world-class metropolis. Uh, this was one of my European vacation books. I was a year late reading it, and I'm going to say up front, it, I cannot recommend it highly enough to basketball fans, to people who like history books, every single human with a connection to Oklahoma or Oklahoma City. It's 400 pages long. It's about 25 different things minimum. And it is just an absolute delightful read. If there are uh, a couple of tentpole themes that run through the book is is obviously the history and and the sort of um, uh, man-made boom of the town of Oklahoma City. But the other one is the thunder. And that's, that's what we're here to talk about in part. And that's what people... Uh, who listen to this podcast would be most interested in. So uh, congratulations and and thank you for coming in, first of all. Thank you so much. Thank you for reading the book. And I'm thrilled to be here. I'm a, a devoted listener to this pod. I listen to every episode while I wash dishes and stuff. Washing dishes is the most underrated household task because it's easy uh-huh. and you feel as if you're accomplishing something. But it's but it's like by far the easiest. But you can be like, no, no, look at me. I'm chipping in. Oh, I'm yeah. like these dishes are becoming dirty to like slightly less dirty, and then I'm putting them one by one in the dishwasher. And I'm 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 part of the household. I'm contributing when it's really the, you're yeah. you're doing the low hanging fruit of household chores. It's true, but do it anyway. Um. So uh. And and by the way, also just apropos of 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 the book. I, beyond anything else, you're a beautiful writer. Thank and, you. And I, I, I'm going to read sentences later in this podcast, just five or six that I picked out that I read and I was like, God damn, I'm envious of this person <laughs> that I have never met before. And, and if you like writing, you will like this book. So this book is interesting on multiple levels. So I will just, let's just start here. You are not from Oklahoma City. No. Um, you are not a basketball writer full time. You are not a historian. Nope. Um, you are not even from the South or the Midwest. Um, Are you saying I'm unqualified to have written this book? No, the opposite. And, and, but why? What happened? How did you suddenly become so much in the vortex of Oklahoma City that one night you are um, you are hanging out with Wayne Coyne, the lead singer of the Flaming Lips, and you commit an act of vandalism <laughs> because you are such a part of the fabric of the city? Yeah, well, what happened really, it starts with basketball. Um, I grew up a lifelong huge fan of basketball and enthusiastic mediocre pickup player um and basketball to me growing up was just this like wonderful american mythology almost like when i was a kid like barkley and jordan and bird and all these people i would sneak out of church to watch the games and it just like completely captured my imagination so i've always loved basketball and so that's where it started the um my boss the editor of the new york times magazine was chatting with me in his office and he said, we need you to write a big, long story about something, big cover story, colorful, crazy topic. What's it going to be? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, you're a basketball fan. What about this team in Oklahoma City? This was the summer of 2012. They had just lost the finals. Um, and I was like, that is a fascinating collection of human beings um, in a place no one expects to find them. And he said, just go out there and see what you can find. Uh, and he gave me great advice. He said, you can never depend on the athletes themselves for quotes. So you're not going to build your story around that. So uh, really follow your own curiosity. And that's how this project was born. I flew out on the airplane. I read a history of Oklahoma and my jaw hit the floor. And I was like, I've never re- heard any of this history before. It's the most American, ridiculous, uh, chaotic history you can imagine and i just didn't know any of it you're not overselling it because uh, so i in a former life i was a history phd student and the sort of settling of the midwest once you get once you get through like the removal of the native americans and the genocide thereof and all of that is sort of like it's this sort of it's not a black spot like people write about it but when i was studying it was just like there weren't a lot of books about there's books about the deep south there's books about race relations there's books about the settling of california i had never read any of this stuff about how Oklahoma was empty, 
Mm-hmm. And then it was at the sound of a bullhorn sounded by the government was settled by thousands of crazy land hungry people who tried to form a government and make streets and just out of like it was like create a city from thin air on your computer but in 1880 or something yeah it's 1889 it's the worst way a city has ever been created in all of human history (laughs) i mean that's that's not hyperbole that's just a factual statement um and oklahoma city went from zero to something like 10,000 people in a matter of hours um and yeah, we should say this was this was what was called Indian Territory. It was land that that um, indigenous people had been relocated to from their original lands, and then they were cleared out for really complicated reasons, and it became quote unquote empty. And all these white settlers wanted it, and that's how Oklahoma started. Um, and then, so so to me, when I read that crazy crazy history, and I was coming in again with my primary subject being this fascinating basketball team. I thought, well, that's interesting. You've got this sudden explosion of chaos um, into a place where you wouldn't expect it. And then you have this epic struggle to create order out of that chaos. And I thought that kind of describes the Thunder roster pretty well. That kind of describes this mixture of MVP level talents, uh, Harden, Westbrook, Durant, um, very well. How do you coordinate that kind of on-floor chaos into some kind of system that makes sense? And so I, I saw the basketball and the story of the plays echoing each other in all kinds of ways. Well, it's just, it's, you know, when Russell got traded to Houston, I, I wrote a reaction to it and, and I wrote something about like how the thunder of the last 10 to 12 years are maybe the defining team of the NBA in a lot of different ways and the, in how many through lines of NBA history run through Oklahoma City, mm-hmm. even though they did not win a championship. And, and you write this book, and it's we're going to talk basketball. It's centered a lot on the it's centered on the 2012-13 season and the, the aftermath of the James Harden trade, which mm-hmm. again six years later, seven years later, looks like even more of a mega event than we thought it was at the time. Right. Um, and Harden is long gone. Durant is long gone. And ain't going back anytime soon, based right. on what he said yesterday. Uh, and now Russell is gone. And you would think, um, boy, this, this, it's time to close this book. And yet it, they just come up over and over again. Russ gets traded and you are forced to reckon with what exactly happened here. And then Durant gives an interview to the Wall Street Journal in which he, essentially says i haven't had a conversation with anybody from oklahoma city since i left i don't trust anybody there i'm not ever going back there in the near future blah 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 like and and so has he completely severed ties and and also sort of again makes you wonder like what is this guy about like i still i what is he seeking i still don't understand what his ultimate motivations are and these characters just keep popping back up and it's just this this book is just going to be endlessly relevant so so for let's leave Harden to the side pick russ or pick kd based on the kd's interview yesterday or um uh the russ trade which one of those do you want to talk about oh they're, they're both such great characters and they obviously couldn't be more different it's such a gift to all of us that they ended up starting their careers together um Let's go Durant. Okay. Because he was just in the Wall Street Journal with that very Duranty interview. You have in the book, um, you get to, you, you, well, first of all, how, how many days and nights do you think you have spent in Oklahoma City in the last That's six a years? Good question. People keep asking me that. I've got to count up all the trips. I didn't move there. Um, I live, uh, just outside New York City and, and I started working on this book and just took as many trips as I could. So I'd go out for five days and then three weeks later I'd go out for three days and then I'd go out for two weeks. So I don't know, 30 um, and trips. You, 30 trips. Yeah. Um, God knows how many days. You you yeah. inter- you interviewed all these players. You watched them up close. Um, Durant gives this fierce interview yesterday where he says all the stuff he said about Oklahoma City – said he was never going to be one of the warriors he realizes now he was never going to be one of them um and you tell this great story in the book about that you 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 tell that durant just almost out of nowhere tells you this story about playing his father one-on-one yeah and his father just destroys him ruthlessly and he takes some sort of lesson out of that and i remember reading in the book 
he's trying to make a profound point about what this game and losing taught him about life. And I don't understand what he's saying, uh-huh. which is often something that I, I, a, a reaction to, that I have to some of Kevin's like longer soliloquies is like, I don't understand where we're going. So tell the story and what, what did you think he was trying to say? So, yeah, that was in a, a, a sit down courtside interview that went on for, I remember, 18 minutes. It seemed much longer. He's a very, um, engaging person, which I think everyone who sits next to him finds. He, he really looks at you. He's got these big sort of searching deep eyes and he's really, as he talks, seriously considering you, connecting you with you, thinking about what you think about what he's saying. You can see all that going on. It's the opposite of Russell Westbrook. And so we had this really deep conversation in just under 20 minutes. And I remember the narrative at that time, again, summer of 2012, was Katie is nice. Nicest guy on planet Earth, uh, unimpeachable in every way. The backpack. The backpack, right. The Bible, kissing his mom before and after every game. Um, and I remember talking to a lot of people and saying, I mean, come on, this is kind of a cartoon of a person. Is this the case? And they're all like, yeah, I mean, that's just who he is. He's just that nice. And I asked him about it. I'm like, well, obviously you don't become in the 99.9999 forever uh, percentile of successful human beings at anything, let alone a sport that requires you to be super aggressive and competitive while being like, uh, you know, an angel. And how do you balance those things? And his answer was to tell me this story about his father. He said, I used to be a really bad sport when I was a kid. I said, really? He said, yeah, when I would lose, I would get furious. And uh, I said, well, what changed? And he said, he told me this story about his dad and this game of one-on-one in the driveway. I think at his aunt's house. And uh, his dad, who had been out of the picture for a long time and kind of had just come back around, I think. And his dad just walloped him and did it mercilessly, just backing him down um, you know, posting him up and then talking trash to, I think Durant was 11. Um, and to the point that Durant finally just broke down, weeping, ran into the house, locked all the doors, locked everybody out. He was alone in the house, weeping for a long, long time by himself. And then he said, after a while, he just sort of stopped and started thinking about what had happened. And he thought, why am I crying? What am I so upset about? Um, and he said at some point, something at that point, something changed inside of him where he realized that you have to create this hard separation between what happens on the court and how you react to it as a person. And you have to uh, be able to essentially control your emotions, right? Which is the Durant that I think we all got used to seeing is this guy who's even keeled, quote unquote, nice. Um, and I think that was the lesson he was he was taking from that story was like that was the moment I became the nice guy in the sense of he was able to control those negative emotions and just kind of, I guess, repress them not to get too psychoanalytical but like to push down the negative stuff and project out the positive stuff and and really switch back and forth but on his own terms it's just so interesting to hear him talk about you know after the the 2018 finals were were so uninteresting as Mm -hmm. a as a as a basketball exercise when the warriors swept an overmatched cleveland team um that all i did was write about durant and talk to people about durant like what does this guy want out of life what is his what is you know everyone was looking ahead to his free agency you know what is he going to do what is he seeking does he want his own team and no one really could figure it out you know steve nash told me when we won our when when kd won his first title with the warriors he was unfulfilled he was mopey he 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 acted as if he thought um winning would 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 make for some revelation or would fulfill my life in some way that it that it didn't and kevin told me for that story you know like i'm not sitting here trying to win as many titles as michael michael Mm -hmm. jordan like i don't really care like i don't get me wrong i care about winning but it's it's not the be all and end all and then he talks about the warriors yesterday in the wall street journal and says you know i just i I was never going to be one of the guys there it was it was it was never going to i was just never it was not going to be like that for me i was different yeah Yeah. um and and that made me ask many different questions from him is, is a 
what does he want? Does he just want camaraderie in some sort of organic way that he hasn't been able to find? Um, how did he not anticipate that he would never be like them? Like that, that was baked into his decision to go there. This is a 73 win team that's won a title already. And you are the extra accidental salary cap spike superstar that wasn't drafted. The only one of the stars that wasn't drafted. You play a different style. Like, yeah, of course you're never going to be one of them. That's how it works. And, and of course fans are never going to give you the credit that you think you deserve for winning there because it's just expected. It's easy. It's what happened. And it, and frankly, it was easy. Um, and, and I'll, I'll never forget. I interviewed Rich Kleiman for that story, his business manager, mm-hmm. friend, everything. And, and Rich gave me a quote that I thought was very revealing, perhaps not in the way that he anticipated being revealing. He said, you know, everyone says we took the easy way out by coming here but every article about kevin's business interests and they're now a cottage industry of articles Mm -hmm. 80 percent of the comments about how he's are about how he's a snake Mm -hmm. how is that taking the easy way out if that's all we get told all the time and i thought all you're revealing to me there is that you're reading the comments yeah exactly um so he's just i just don't i don't even know what to make of him seven years after the events of your book i don't really know what to make of him what is he what is he seeking in life? Will he find it in Brooklyn? I don't know. Right. What I came to realize in writing the book, I think, and, and especially after he left Oklahoma City, was that in OKC, I think he was just this gigantic blank slate that he presented to the public. And they projected onto that what they wanted to see, which was the nicest guy in the world. And of course, he has that aspect to him, but that's not who he is or who he was. I think, you know, and... We're, there's a certain amount of armchair psychologizing that that feels irresponsible after a certain point. I mean, I, I'm always careful to say I sat with him for 18 minutes. 18 minutes. I was around him plenty at games, practices, in the locker room, all that. But we sat and talked, focused one-on-one for 18 minutes. But in that time, I feel like I got a read on his personality. And that, that thing I was describing before where you can see him looking at you, really looking at you and thinking about what you're thinking about what he's saying. It's all, it's almost like the social, uh, interpersonal equivalent of like reading the comments, you know? He's a sensitive guy. He's truly an introspective, as far as I can tell, sensitive, thoughtful, earnest guy who wants to be loved, I think. I really think he wants validation, which is such a natural, Human thing. I mean, I identify with that completely. I identify with him much more than I do with Russell Westbrook, who maybe fascinates me more because he's so much different. Uh, he's so, he's, he's so, his psychology is so kind of alien to my own. But Kevin Durant, yeah, he's super self-conscious. He wants to be liked. Uh, he's thoughtful. He's contradictory. Um, I don't know that he's always the most reliable narrator of what's going on um, outside of his head. You know, this stuff about Oklahoma City and how it must have all been fake, all the affection they had for him, how he hasn't spoken to the organization since then. I don't that's not my read on the situation at all. Um, yeah, I would be I would be very surprised. And I haven't asked the relevant people this. I would just be very surprised if Sam Presti hadn't spoken to Kevin Durant in three years now like i i I would be very surprised given the way sam conducts himself and conducts business that when they played he didn't attempt to go say hello to kevin durant that that would that would surprise me and certainly the larger the larger team that that organization i'd be shocked if people hadn't had meaningful interactions with kevin durant over the last several years um but maybe not who knows i mean that you know again you don't want to speculate too much um but my sense of him was always, I, I liked being around him. He seemed to me like a genuinely good person. It was funny, though, watching him over the years. You saw him kind of take on Russ's persona a little bit. He started to do that kind of angry, angry toward the media thing. He was he was kind of imitating Russ in a way that I actually saw Paul George doing this last season, huh. too. Um Russ has a very powerful effect on well, everything in his orbit. Have you, are you surprised? Did it surprise you that – now, we don't know the particulars of what happened. You write about Russ a lot in the book as well. Um, are, are you surprised that he 
indicated to the Thunder that at, at the very least he indicated to them, I'm ready to move on if you want to move me. I don't know if he asked for a trade or he pushed his way out, but at the very least, the guy who the guy who stayed mm-hmm. and the guy who called Durant a cupcake mm-hmm. uh, or or made the cupcake thing on Instagram and all of this. The guy who made it a point of pride that this is my team, this is where I put down roots. Are you surprised at all that he arrived at a stage where he at least told him, I'm ready if you are? No, no. And also the guy who lives by a, a personal code of deep loyalty. Um, that said, no. Once Paul George left, um, I think the kind of the tectonic plates were shifting in terms of the power structure in the West. And I think it just made sense for everybody. And I think um, everybody kind of got a free pass in terms of narrative. Like Russ could say, yeah, I'll go. And it wasn't really like he chose to leave. It was kind of like the ground moved under his feet. And the Thunder, too. It wasn't like they got rid of Russ. Something else drastic happened that, um, in a way, forced their hand to get rid of Russ or made it so much more appealing to get rid of Russ than to keep him. So... No, it seemed kind of inevitable Inevitable once Paul George made that decision. I read the book and came away thinking, I don't think Sam likes Russell Westbrook very much. <laughs> and I think I was wrong, right? Yeah, you are. He fascinates me. Number one, he fascinates me. Doesn't mean I like him, but I actually do. Um, I root for him harder than any player not on the Portland Trailblazers, which is my team. I'm from Oregon. So originally. last year's playoffs was really just a home run scenario for you. Portland, Oklahoma City, and Portland wins. It was so great. <laughs> and I happened to be in Oklahoma City for game three, and I felt a little bad about it uh, sitting in media row and watching the game and being around all my you know Thunder friends and acquaintances I've come to know over all these years. And I remember actually somebody in the organization asked me, because they knew I was a Trailblazers fan. They said, well, you're a Blazers fan, but you've been around this organization so much. You've invested so much time in understanding us and explaining us. I mean, really, where does your allegiance lie in this series? And I said, "It's honestly, it's not even close. And he said, us, right? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Portland Trailblazers. I, yeah, I'm in love with Damian Lillard. You know, there's something about a, a, a childhood allegiance to a place. And to of a course. team that is a huge part of the reason OKC wanted so desperately to have a basketball team, to yep. have that feeling for people who live there. Like this is our team all our lives. We will be fascinated by and in love with this team and root for them no matter what. That's kind of how I feel about this the is what, what you just said about the, the pull of sports is is the center of a the pivot point of a little bit of a disconnect i think between some star athletes including and especially durant Mm. and fans so um in the wake of that interview yesterday someone tweets at durant about oklahoma city or something like if you don't understand because durant is just constantly like all i decided to do is play for another team that's Mm -hmm. all like why are you burning my jersey why are you betrayed um, it's and, such an interesting framing by him. Right. And mm-hmm. so someone on Twitter says, well, Kevin, th- you know, if, if you were dating a girl and she left you for another guy, like, how would you feel? And he responded back, see your mistake. Something to the effect of see your mistake is, is like, you think we were dating. This was just a job for me. And he has to, on some level, understand that that's not how sports works for regular, for most people. Like, that's just not how it is. It's more, it, you're, it's just more than that. Yeah, and that's never how he conducted himself while he was in Oklahoma City. I mean, he was he was all in on the other side of that narrative, which was, I am connected to this place forever. I never want to leave here. This means so much to be representing this city. So I think, again, he's a little bit of an unreliable narrator in that stuff. And it's convenient for him now to say it's just a job. But And he must – I just – I, w- I would love to t- talk to him at some point, including on this podcast. Like, he just must know when he says something like that, that that's just not the nature of sports fandom. It's it, it's not like taking another job or dating a girl and breaking up with her. It means something more to a place, particularly like Oklahoma City, as you said, which wanted a team for so, so, so long. And you go into how the NHL said thanks, but no thanks. You go into how United Airlines was like, yeah, if it comes down between Oklahoma City and Indianapolis, we don't really think our employees are going to want to live in Oklahoma City. Sorry. like, And, and this became theirs. That was one of the saddest moments, yeah, in 1991 when they were rejected. And the airline said, yeah, we just couldn't make our employees live here. The town is really, really, really crappy. <laughs> <laughs> At that point. 
At that point. At that point. Yeah. And then, and then they rebuilt themselves. And part of that, the kind of crowning achievement of that renaissance was getting a professional basketball team in Oklahoma City. Um, please tell the story about um, when Russell Westbrook politely told you that you are not in a position to make deals with him. <laughs> Yeah, this was uh, that same trip where I spoke with Durant, my first trip out to interview the players in Oklahoma City. Um, they'd been trying to get Russ for me all week. KD was one of my first interviews. He came right over, extremely pleasant, engaging, etc. Um, Westbrook held it off all week. The PR guys were scrambling to get him to sit down with me. Finally, uh, we we're supposed to speak after practice. He kept me waiting for over an hour. And he finally comes walking across the floor with a PR guy, maybe with like a gun to his back or something. <laughs> and uh, he sits down with me and we have maybe the worst interview of my professional career where um, it lasts less than 10 minutes. He's on the phone for a large part of it. Talking um, about how he's about to be done with the interview. Yeah. He's telling his friend, oh, don't worry about it. I'll be back to the house in like 10 minutes. I'm just getting done talking to this guy. He's giving me his, you know, uh, one word answers. And finally, I tried everything I could. And uh, I finally said, all right, that's it. And um, we got up. He walked over to the PR office and I followed him because they were my contact people. And I just leaned against the door and kind of watched him interact with them. And, um, he had some paperwork to sign for some basketball camps and things. So he sat down and he's signing all his paperwork, which he famously does all himself. He pays his bills at the practice facility and all that. So he's signing, signing paperwork. And I notice he's, he's signing papers with his left hand. He's listed as right handed. He shoots with his right hand. And one of the PR guys says, Oh yeah, Russell is listed as a right handed player, but actually he does a lot of stuff with his left hand, including writing. And Westbrook's head snaps up to stare at me where I'm leaning on the doorway. And he says, don't put that in your article. And, uh, this was the most attention he'd shown me all day. And, uh, I said, well, I'll make you a deal. How about you answer one of my previous questions, which was, I was asking him about, um, the nicknames he comes up with for everybody in the organization and the team, which is famous in the organization. He of course wouldn't say a word about it. To Not me. one nickname. No. Um, and, uh, I said, all right, I'll keep that out of my article if you tell me one of your nicknames. And he just looked at me with like this look of unspeakable contempt and <laughs> said, you don't get to bargain with me. <laughs> and, uh, and I laughed. I mean, you had to laugh like, um, and I write in the book, you know, pe people coming away thinking like, Oh, what a jerk. I mean, yes and no. He's this kind of like charmingly hostile personality. You know, I think we all know people like that. People who like to kind of push the edges a little bit, tell, tell jokes to their friends that are kind of mean. Um, he's like that. And I found it actually in the moment face to face to be kind of charming. Like I didn't feel threatened. I didn't feel attacked. Uh, I thought it was funny. Um, there's also in that same scene, the, the PR guys had this gigantic map of the season, every game of the season schedule they'd print it out it was standing this freestanding huge thing must one of those things that cost like two hundred dollars at kinko's or something in the middle of the office and russ is like oh that thing's great can i can i have that and they said well no we're using it to plan the whole season right now but we'll gladly get one made for you and we'll have it ready for you and he said well why can't i just take this one <laughs> he said i'm the player like shouldn't i just get it and he was joking. I mean, he, he didn't grab it and run away. He didn't, he wasn't really pulling a power play. He was being kind of funny and they thought it was funny. And I guess they made him his own. He didn't take it, but it was like, the, there were all these little moments where I think he just, I would ask people sometimes like, are you guys afraid of Russell Westbrook? And so I was going to ask you about this. And they would say, there was like, I remember once asking somebody that and there was this long silence and then they were like, no, um, but he really keeps us on edge. Like you're always a little bit on edge. It's interesting because one of the when everyone has had time to digest that it's over, that all the stars are gone. Yep. And they're starting from ground zero again. And one of the questions that's going to be asked is 
the, the Thunder, the Thunder have been all about the players and making the players feel like the organization belongs to them, mm-hmm. but also no, no one is above anybody else, right? Even in their marketing, you talk about this in the book, everyone needs to be marketed. There's, right. it's not just a picture of James Harden like it is in Houston. Um, people will ask, did they, enable is too strong of word did they turn over too much power to one guy did they did 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 they keep playing this style of what became rust ball Mm -hmm. um even though and i went back and traced this it's it's not it's not um it's not a myth you can go back on the record and, and look at what Scott Brooks or Billy Donovan or Nick Collison or Every Andre year, Robertson yeah. would say about how they have to change the offense. Yeah. And it never changed. And between that and the triple doubles, which we'll talk about, um, Stephen Adams having a worse defensive rebounding rate almost than Andrea Bargnani, the worst rebounding big man in the history of basketball. Um, it, and, and I think it all came to a head. It was really interesting last playoffs. How Russell Westbrook saying no comment or next question, next question to Barry Trammell. Yeah, w- was the first time that the NBA fan and whatever community at large took the other side, turned against Russ, said this guy's just being a jerk. Mm-hmm. Why? Like this isn't charming anymore. It's not cute. Mm-hmm. It's not part of his fierce, powerful, take no prisoners persona. He's just being kind of a jerk yeah it felt it, petty it felt interesting to see because it wasn't new it that particularly wasn't new and him being standoffish wasn't new and him playing the way he played wasn't new and it was just it, maybe it was just because they were losing they were just not that good of a team anymore but it was interesting to see it there was this sort of collective like this has run its course everyone it, it, it like I, it was just weird for me to see that yeah i think there was a kind of collective exhaustion I think that feeling of being kept on edge at every moment. Um, Russell Westbrook is always in the gym. Uh, he's always around. Again, he's signing bills when he's not playing basketball. He's signing. He, he's he's paying his bills in the back of the practice facility. So you're never not going to see him around. And if he's someone who keeps you constantly on edge, guessing is he mad at me? Is he joking right now? I think it wears you down over time. And then I think, you know, I mean, Russ Ball, yes. Houston plays Harden Ball, right? They're kind of equivalent in that sense. And it's great because Harden's uh, numbers, uh, Harden is like the perimeter Wilt Chamberlain. Russell Westbrook, at his best, has been close to that. Yes. But for the past two seasons, Russell Westbrook can't shoot. Um, and so I think once his ability to put the ball through the basket went away... It made him like a sub pro level player at doing that. I think all the stresses that come along with Russ Ball and with Russ as the fulcrum of your whole organization, I think they overwhelmed the good parts. I think this may, if this may be an, it, one of the three most interesting questions for the next NBA season. And it's either going to be answered within the first 20 games in a way that it, that's exciting or answered within the first 20 games is, and let's move on to the next thing is, what is West, Russell Westbrook going to do when James Harden has the ball? Mm-hmm. And it'll either be something interesting mm-hmm. or it'll just be like nothing, like he's always done when he doesn't have the ball. And they're just going to have to figure it out. And part of the figuring it out will be they just play a ton of minutes each to his own and Russ right. gets to run the offense that way. But I really hope that the answer is interesting and because it it could be anything, it could be cut, it could be trying to get offensive rebounds, it could be set screens for Harden, it could be a, it could be push the pace because and play my version of Russ Ball with Harden. It could be lots of things. Couldn't he be the best off ball player in the league? No, he could not be the best off ball player. He could okay. be a, he could be, he, a, be <laughs> he could be a useful off ball player. No wait, could, wait. Maybe he could be not the best off ball player because that implies a catch and shoot ability that he does not have. By the way, maybe you you see this happen sometimes though. He's had years where he has shot. In the low 30s on yeah. catch and shoot threes, maybe he just has a year because he's going to get these looks that he hasn't had in ages in terms of how open they are. Maybe he just has one of those random years where he shoots 38% on catch and shoot. Like, yeah. that's not impossible. No, no, no. Can we talk about my theory of Russell Westbrook's yips? Ooh, yes, I forgot about this. Please give the yips. Yes, this is interesting. I know the theory. Give the yips theory. Well, 
I think people look past this because his strength has never been shooting. He's never been Steph Curry, right? Understatement. But he had a cotton shot for a while. He had the cotton shot, which is what he and his dad called this pull-up jump shot um, from the elbow, which he could stop on a dime. You know, he was the fastest player in the NBA probably or one of the top two or three for a lot of years. And he could stop at full charge and pop straight up into the air around the free throw line and hit this pull-up jump shot. And it became an incredibly dangerous weapon. Um. And he was an okay three-point shooter, and he could make enough, right? He was in, what, 82% free throw shooter? And for the last two seasons, I don't have the numbers in front of me, I think he's been in the low 60s at the, at the free throw line, right? This this last season was a, something of a nadir, I think. Uh, I think the last two. I'll, I'll, I'm looking it up right now. And my Yips Russell Westbrook conspiracy theory is? 74 and 66 the last two seasons. Okay. 74 is higher than I thought. Um, that Russell Westbrook, uh, among his many interesting qualities, is so as wild as he is on the court, he's incredibly orderly and devoted to his routines off the court. Um, he famously, you know, has the same peanut butter and jelly sandwich before every game. Cut 6, on 17 the p.m. Chapel, let's go. Yeah, exactly. He's got all these little time slots that he hits and stuff. Um, in his preparation, he parks in the same spot, etc. Has anyone ever taken his spot? Is there a story about that? I would love there to be a story of like there was the, in, yeah. the intern accidentally is like, oh, this spot's open, great. I feel like it was Andre Robertson or something. It was another player who parked in his spot, and I think Westbrook went and um, yeah, this was in a the the big uh, Sports Illustrated profile of him um, by Lee, current Clippers employee Lee Jenkins. Yes. Great profile of him in which I think one of the anecdotes was somebody parked in his spot. Westbrook (laughs) pulls in, parks directly behind that person, blocking them in, and goes into the gym and and goes about his business, and he's done when he's done, and the other person is sitting around waiting for Russell Westbrook. in regular human world, that's almost sociopathic. Yes. In basketball star world, it's like that's somewhere south of a Kevin Garnett story. Like, it's it's not yeah, that crazy. True. Anyway, the yips. Anyway, so he's got these incredibly um, precise routines that he never, ever deviates from. The NBA, in the offseason, in an effort to speed up the game, changes the rules surrounding free throw shooting routines. You are no longer allowed to walk outside of the three-point line between free throws. Russell Westbrook's routine has always been, since I think he was eight years old, to walk from the free throw line to half court, turn around and walk back, take the ball and shoot a free throw. In my conspiracy theory, it was the changing of that rule that messed up the whole delicate balance of his routines and made him get into his head and start missing free throws all of a sudden, which he had never had a problem with. He's a clutch free throw shooter. He's great. Um, and he started missing free throws and that got in his head and it, you know, his cotton shot is essentially a free throw on the run and those started going out too. Then he starts blowing layups, which he's one of the great layup makers of all time. And it's just became this kind of case of the yips that true to form was stronger than anybody else's yips. You know, when Russell Westbrook, this Titanic force of willpower starts to go a little off in his mind he's going to start missing and he did and i feel like that's where his shooting went because it's really like his mvp season versus his last season i know he still averaged a triple double but the shooting numbers are drastically different and that's the only explanation i can come up with and um i'm sticking to that it's not it, look there have been crazier explanations for other phenomena that have been proffered have you the, heard that around the league my yips theory i think you're the second person to to, to hit me with the yips okay. theory um, of course, there is a much more famous case of yips currently in the NBA, and that's Markel Fultz, and we'll see if he ever gets over those yips. I feel so bad for those people. I'm very prone to the yips in all areas of my life. I famously uh, can't throw a Frisbee further than five feet in front of me, even though I grew up being a fine Frisbee thrower. It just I got the yips about Frisbees. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever had the yips about anything. That's awesome. Yeah, I don't think I... 
I live in fear of like if I were an athlete, a professional athlete, I would probably live in fear of developing. The Imagine ups. the agony of an unexplainable loss of an essential skill. Yeah, it would be terrible. That you can't think your way out of. It would be terrible. Let's stop talking about it. It's freaking me out. You, the book is set in 2012-13, which is, of course, the year that James Harden was traded. And so we have to talk about the James Harden trade, yeah. um, which is maybe the most important thing that has happened in the NBA in the last 10 years. I don't know. It, we'll see. LeBron changing teams. I mean, you could take your pick. But the, a trade is just inherently more interesting yeah. than a free agency decision because multi, the team has agency in that decision. More people have conspired to make the decision. What I, You know, I'm never going to get tired of talking about trade. Sorry, Thunder fans. But now I have a sentence that I can point to that just – I can just say, just read this. If you want to know why I don't think that was a good trade and didn't at the time, just read this. Okay. Um, and it's your sentence. So Super. I'm going to c- open your book to page 219 and just hold it up for people all around the world when I see them. And the sentence is this. Plenty of subtleties had gone into decision to trade him, of course. Need, chemistry, taxes, the future. But none of that made up for this sickening central fact. The Thunder had had this player on their team. They'd had a way to keep him. And they had chosen to let him go. That's it. That's the whole, you can hit me with all the arguments and all the reasons. And I still don't think the story has properly been told. And I think you hinted a lot of it here, which is like, I, I personally, I think the money angle has been overblown. I do too. And the chemistry basketball angle has been underblown is not a thing. I do Under, too. Underplayed. But that's it. That is all it is because they got the money got close. Yes, the money got almost comically close. Yes, and it was comically close to to a degree that required explaining. And, and then you get in, you get into well, there is the chemistry argument that perhaps the higher ups would make, which is if we don't extend this guy, it could ruin our season mm-hmm. because it's going to hang over the entire season. I get it, I understand that. They had time and they had leverage and they did not have to do anything. They could have just let it play out. Everyone would have understood it. I don't think it would have ruined their season. And instead of playing it out, they chose to act early and get ahead of it and trade for Kevin Martin, Jeremy Lamb, the pick that became Steven Adams and some other stuff that I don't even remember. It's a hard list when you say it like that. Um, yeah. and, and that, that, it's just, you can argue and argue and argue until your face turns blue. That's all that matters. They had time and they had leverage and they did not have to do it. And they chose the wrong guy. They chose Ibaka over him. They can frame it however they want. Mm-hmm. They chose Ibaka over him and they chose Westbrook over him. Both choices end up being wrong. And now Harden and Russ play on the same team. You can't make this up. No, you can't. Kevin Durant plays for the Brooklyn Nets, which weren't even a team at the time you're writing this book. They were the New Jersey Nets. <laughs> and it's over. It's over, and they have a hundred draft picks now yeah. to try and make it not over. They actually have a team that's all right on the court yeah. that it has the upside of a low playoff team and the downside of something much worse than that. Well, and if we're talking crazy narrative that you couldn't write, who'd they get back for Russell Westbrook? I tweeted this when the trade happened. Like you trade Russell Westbrook for Chris Paul, and if people people maybe don't remember. The possibility of NBA basketball in Oklahoma City, a complete improbability, became a reality when Oklahoma City stepped up to host the New Orleans Hornets after Hurricane Katrina. And who is the hot young New Orleans Hornets player who was welcomed with open arms in Oklahoma City and embraced um to an extent that made everybody in the league go, whoa, this place loves basketball and maybe could actually support a team. It's Chris Paul. So the guy who kind of kicked off this whole nutso basketball story in OKC is the one who comes back in return for Russell Westbrook, the last one standing from this sort of glory period. I mean, you couldn't, I I tweeted at the time, Sam Presti is an artist. Like this is like a novel. Uh, You know, it's funny. Um, the, 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 they had time and they had leverage thing. You know, this was, I wrote about this before I left for vacation in July. Um, this was the summer of the big two in the NBA. Like the big three right. is dead. Hello, big two. And it got me thinking about, you know, what actually is the best way to build a championship team, two or three. 
it's it's a it's a facile question in a lot of different ways because sure. there's gray areas between who's a star who's not and you don't get to just necessarily pick these things and if you look at nba history probably the more common way is two stars and a third guy who's like a really really good third guy yep. not three superstars i don't think that necessarily means that that model is better that's causation correlation confusion i think i just think it's more it's more common uh in the last 15 years the big three has been more common starting with the Celtics. Now you could argue that the 80s Celtics and the Lakers had a big three, depending on how you define parish and worthy and all this fine, sure. whatever. Um, uh, and people in the NBA disagree. They're fascinated by the big two thing that's happening now, particularly with Brooklyn and the Clippers, because they have big two and depth. And to get a third, they would have to sacrifice a lot of that depth. Mm-hmm. Um, the trump card for a lot of people and this is a very um this is this is a persuasive argument to me is the third star is a hedge against any of the other ones getting injured in right. may and that's what happened to the thunder because the thunder made this trade and then sort of you you get into you call it the process which is ironic because the process then became a whole other thing sure but the process was in your telling and i think this is accurate um, we can't, this three star thing is going to be quaking at the edges yeah. for as long as we can do it financially, sharing the ball. Mm-hmm. Like it's going to be, it, it has tension built into it and it might blow up. Mm-hmm. And so we can take one of the stars and exchange that guy for five things that maybe two of those things we can exchange for three other things. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden we're set up to be good for 20 years. Yep. If. Yep stars a and b stay right and if stars a and b if you win the title stars a and b are going to stay and they and they very people are never going to this will never get people will always focus on the failure in this year you wrote about mm-hmm. and then again in 2014 2015 and 2016 for four straight years mm-hmm. they could have won the championship absolutely they were that good yep 2013 we'll talk about it russ gets hurt 2014 Everyone gets hurt, right? No, 2014-15, everybody gets hurt. 2015-16, the Warriors ruined them forever. They could have won. They didn't, and they had unti- – uh, 2014 is when Ibaka got hurt against the Spurs. Yep. Um, and, and you know, when Russ went down in 2013, it had, had they had Harden, they still could have made a run at the championship. I know. Yep. That's the clincher. Yeah, that's that's the ultimate counter argument. You know what it's I like, forgot about Pat Beverly and Russ Westbrook? What? I forgot two details. Yeah, I get into this pretty deep in my book. This I sort of retell that incident. Number one, it was the first start of Patrick yeah. Beverly's career. Yes. That is wild. Yeah, they had pulled him out from uh, the Ukraine. Ukraine. Or, yeah. And, uh, and, and it was kind of a desperation move by Kevin McHale, the coach at the time, who they'd been absolutely blown out. In that first game, the Thunder blew out the Rockets. This was not going to be a contest. This was going to be an easy sweep. And one of the wrenches Mikhail threw in the system was, I'm going to start this no-name, little tiny, feisty point guard, Patrick Beverly. First start of his career. And he takes down Russell Westbrook. It's amazing. The second detail I had forgotten. Do you have any guesses what the second detail is? Uh, no, no. Hashim Thabit? No. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, the presence of Hashim Thabit? No. Okay. That Russell, Russell Westbrook played the entire played the second, second half. half, the entire second, second half of that game after what we then realized a couple days later, tearing his meniscus. Yeah. Yeah. We all saw it happen. We all saw the incident. I was in the arena that day. I was sitting next to our mutual friend, Royce Young, great Thunder writer. Um, and Russ gets hurt. And of course, everybody's watching Russ to see if he's really hurt, if it's a little tweak. He, he goes away. He comes back and he's back in the game. So it can't be that bad. I remember saying to Royce at one point, it looks like he's limping a little bit. Like he's running with a little hitch. He's still running faster than everyone else on the court. And yeah, he literally did not come out for a second in that second half. And he played great. Uh, Boy, and you would love to know. What happens in the locker room? What do they know? What could they possibly know? What is the discussion about? What are the possible injuries here that could have happened? How do mm-hmm. you feel? What are they measuring? How are they moving his knee? Like it's just one of those you get you get ten minutes to decide this. Right. What questions are you asking? What information do you have? Who's making the final call? 
Yep. Did it, did it make any difference? Maybe it didn't make any difference that he played. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm going to read you. I'm going to, now we're going to play a game where I'm going to read nice sentences from your book because I want people to read this book because it's awesome. And also your writing pissed me off how good it was. I um, love, love this game. Uh, yeah, it's a really good game. Yeah, as, thank you. As my friend Jacob Goldstein, who writes for Planet Money, um, once said to me, I love it when people quote me to me. Oh, okay. like, yeah. Yeah. I love it when people quote me to me. Um, this is how you describe Patrick Beverly's approach to, to, to lunging at Russ as the Thunder are going to call a timeout. A moment where everyone, unwritten rule, stops playing. Right. Um, Beverly was reminding Westbrook that there was no pocket of space time, no matter how tiny, in which he should allow himself to feel safe. I read that and I was like, God damn, that's good. Here are some other lines. Are you ready for some Thanks. other lines? Yeah. Let's play, let's play the other lines. The, that was the thing about the Westbrook injury was like, Wes, I mean, Russ was so pissed because that's his natural reaction to a lot of things. But that, the play Beverly made was a Russell Westbrook play. I mean, that was the play of like a crazy gambler who's just going too hard. That was a classic Russell Westbrook play. And it took down Russell Westbrook. Yes. On page 60, you have two lines that were so good that I highlighted them. Holy moly. One, this is your description of Sam Presti, who w- would absolutely be, um, I think, appalled that this is in your book. <laughs> so, he wore designer glasses and hip sneakers. That's that's all true, but this is the one I like. And he gave the impression of a man with a recurring haircut appointment on his calendar. And I thought, my God, he does. That is the exact. And do you know how good that line is? Four hours ago, I had coffee with someone in the NBA, and he said, what are you doing today? And I said, well, I'm having Sam Anderson, the author of Boomtown, on my pocket. So oh, I read that book. I loved it. And I said, yeah, it's, 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 it's really, really good. I really enjoyed it. And he said, you know, it had a line that described Sam Presti so perfectly. And he quoted that line. No way. Yeah. I mean, I stand by it. I like Sam a lot. I don't. I don't think that's a bad quality to have a haircut. No, no, no. I'm not, I, I wish just, I, I wish I had that kind of it, thing it, on my calendar. It was evocative. I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just Thank saying you. it's evocative. It it that's him. Um, I'll, also on Thank that you page. Very much. Also on that page, you describe basketball more than any other sport. It is a game of civics. Every player on every play has to find the proper balance between self interest and self sacrifice. I mean, I don't even need a job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's true, right? That's what makes that game so fascinating. As, as again, as like a as like a proudly mediocre pickup player, like to try to find that balance between selfishness and the greater good, and when is my selfishness actually better for the greater good? And like just even on the lowest possible scrubby weekend warrior old guy league basketball like that stuff is going on all the time it's the best game in the world you describe Thabo Cephalosha as a small absence between two massive presences a little zone of silence between two walls of noise in terms of just the thunder had these two stars and part of their philosophy was we just need a lot of other guys who can do the th- who can do the dirty work and just sort of exist around these two. And like Cephalosha was, that's what he was. Yeah, he always held that starting spot at shooting guard. He was like the one keeping Harden off the floor out of the starting lineup, which is crazy, but makes sense when you think about those two huge presences. That that that's one of my favorite sections of the book, and one of my favorite things I've ever written is is about this incident that no one will have any reason to remember. I remembered. Really? Well, it was at the time it was a huge deal. When yeah, when uh poor Tavo Cephalosha became the target of Russell Westbrook's rage right out on the floor for no good reason. In Memphis, I believe, right? Or was, against Memphis. It was against Memphis yeah. for sure. It was in Oklahoma City because I was there. You were there. I was there. And uh yeah, Russ Russ ran one of these crazy possessions where just no one else was ever going to see the ball. And it was just the most aimless and pointless possession you're ever going to see in basketball where he's trying to back down uh jared bayless who he had this beef with as he does with every point guard in the world and it wasn't going anywhere and then he got called for the obscure mark jackson 10 seconds in the post rule uh and just exploded and it all came out at poor tabo who tried to cut across the lane to give him a target to pass to and he thought he had like bottled him up and taken away his driving lane and and he got ugly out there um, one of the main characters of the book is Wayne Coyne, who's the lead singer of the Flaming Lips, Oklahoma City native. Yep. Um, 
Did the police ever approach you about your involvement in a vandalism scandal in Oklahoma City orchestrated by one Wayne Coin? Yeah, that's been like a running joke and a secret terror every time I come back to the city is like I will get picked up for that. Um, we painted a giant rainbow. I mean, you wrote about it, so I can't, yeah, it's not right. a secret anymore. I had to write about it. Um, yeah, so there's always jokes. Like, I know the chief of police, um, who's a great guy, and, and, uh, he always joked about, like, my readings in OKC being like a sting operation where they're gonna bring me Well, down tell for people vandalism. what happened, because it's a great story, and you become, well, I wonder if you also felt a little like, I'm now becoming a character for a little tiny bit in, yeah. the, in the story I'm gonna write. You know, it's funny, in a lot of my writing, I show up as, I like, to put myself in things. I feel like it's really relatable. I like to use the personal pronoun. In this book, I don't show up very much, but I do in that one section. And yeah, I was drawn in by Wayne. He's this incredibly charismatic rock star, uh, now in his fifties, who has this like wonderful sort of like Jack Sparrow energy and this huge shaggy mane of gray hair. And he's covered with glitter and face paint and his nails are all painted crazy. And he's just walking around being hyper visible in this really like drab gray town. And he's just been doing it for decades. So you get drawn into Wayne's circle. And, and one night we were at this house party and he just started going off about this crazy idea. He had to paint a giant rainbow on the streets in his neighborhood and he had the paint at home and he just needed some people and we were all going to walk in a line and like pour this paint in a rainbow. Everyone got a color. Everyone got a color. I was purple. And um, of course I said yes. When I'm writing, the rule is you just say yes. Uh, and so I did it. It was four in the morning from his compound all the way around the neighborhood. I was terrified the whole time. I'm like a real goody two shoes and you can actually see it in the, in the rainbow. It's still, parts of it are still there. Wayne texted me recently. I was, I was going to have a baby now and uh, he texted me a picture of him and his wife, Katie walking their baby in a stroller and, and underneath it is a little remnant of our street rainbow. And he's like, it's still here. And you never got arrested. No one ever got arrested. It's probably nice. Probably looks nice. Yeah. That was another moment where I thought a lot about, I write a lot in this book about the disparities between the black and white sides of Oklahoma City. Well, okay, so so this is the question I really wanted to ask you. You you allude to this yeah. in your telling of the history and the present about how this is the the reddest spot on the NBA map mm -hmm. is Oklahoma City. Uh, a, a few years ago, uh, shortly after Trump was elected, actually, I was in Oklahoma City and I was um, at uh, hanging out with a member of the organization. And this person asked me, so if you had, if you could write one story about us, mm -hmm. any story you want, to pretend everybody would talk to you, what would it be? And I said, you really want to know? Because it's not a basketball story. And this person, he or she, said yes. And I said, I want to know what it's like to have a Boston-based general manager, a bunch of black players, one of whom, the most famous remaining, uh, Russell Westbrook, came out and said, of course, he's voting for Hillary Clinton. Like, right. and there's no question about it. Um, the founding father of the team is like a Seattle hipster, Nick Collison. Yep. What is it like for all these people to exist in the reddest spot on the NBA map? Mm -hmm. And know that a lot of people who are watching their games every single night and cheering for them and screaming and like the crowd there is the craziest crowd in the NBA probably voted for Trump. What's that like? Mm -hmm. And – uh this person just laughed at me and said, yeah, you're never going to write that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get pretty deep into the racial history of Oklahoma City and and um, the east side history, which is traditionally the black area of the city. And, you know, it was segregated. And there were some – there's a great character in the book named Clara Looper who was this – civil rights hero that more Americans should know about who led these sit-ins in downtown Oklahoma City before there were major heavily publicized sit-ins anywhere else. So it's a great story. Um, I believe and, 1958, right? And the famous Greensboro sit-ins are 1960, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. 59 or 60, but yeah. Um, and led this sustained um, set of demonstrations that actually desegregated the whole city. It's a triumphant part of that city's history that they're really starting to embrace now, which is great. And that was one of my thoughts, as I was saying with like the street rainbow, I was like, this is some real white privilege happening right now. <laughs> Me and the rock star walking around at four in the morning through actually a neighborhood that's, that's kind of gritty and known for being poor. And I'm kind of scared of getting arrested, but I'm not that scared. If I get arrested, I show my card. 
you know, and I say, I show my, my car, the ch- police chief's card that I have in my wallet. And I say, Hey, this is who I am. So, um, it was fascinating diving into that whole chapter of the city's history, which is really just reflects like everything in the story. Um, as you said, I'm not from Oklahoma city. Um, what I saw in this larger history was the entire story of the United States of America kind of compressed into a shorter time frame because it was founded, you know, not much more than a hundred years ago and compressed into one city because everything that happened in every other city in the United States happened in Oklahoma city, but crazier. Um, I, I just can't over emphasize how crazy the history of Oklahoma city is. And I know lots of people who work for the team and live there now, and, and they're very appreciative that you went, I mean, that you went into the history that you actually went in and bothered to learn. Okay. How did this place happen? You know, and that was partly their doing. I mean, that is my natural inclination. I always look at, at the bigger story um, so I can tell the context of, of this basketball story. But they, um, especially early on, they were famously cagey with the media and kind of, I guess you could say, controlling with the media. And it felt a little paranoid with the media. There have been things written about this. And they know this. And uh, so when I first called to say... Hey, PR team, I'd like to come from the New York Times Magazine and write a cover story about your basketball team in the second smallest market in America. Isn't that great? And the response was, um, what exactly is it going to be about? I was like, just everything. Just like, <laughs> just like open up your arms. Let me just embed in your organization and let's do this. And they were like, um, I'm going to run this up the chain and we will get back to you. And it was a long negotiation. And one of their sticking points was, which I was happy to comply with. If you're doing this and you're actually interested in the larger story here and the larger context and the story of our city then we'll work with you on this. So that was a prerequisite. And my first trip out, I did not meet a single basketball player. I met civic leaders. I took a ride around with the police chief who ended up driving me around in a golf cart um, all over the state fair. I met the mayor, but they would not introduce me to a single player until I had some basic understanding of what this city was all about and what it therefore meant that these players were representing this particular place. One of the more telling sm- small stories within a story was um, you, you spent a lot of time with Daniel Orton, who was a you know a backup. You remember him? Yeah, of course. Uh, back up to the backup center yep. um, from Oklahoma City. Only player on the team from Oklahoma City, yeah. And so every player that is acquired by the Thunder – must, by team rule, go visit the memorial to the 1995 bombing, the Timothy McVeigh federal building bombing. Mm-hmm. And Daniel Orton told the team, I grew up here. I was here when the bombing happened. My parents were nearby. Like, I lived it. I'm, I'm, I, I don't have, I've been there many times. And they're like, yeah, you still have to go. Yep. You, it's just the rule. Yeah. And he, so he went. And was like, yeah. All right, I guess I have to go again. Yeah. Um, yeah, you get into all that. I mean, we didn't even talk about the weather. You're embedded with the most famous weatherman in Oklahoma City as the, as historically awful tornadoes are hitting the region. And, and, and he's a major character in the book. And, and I could have read, by the way, a hundred more pages about Gary England, the chief meteorologist of the main TV station there. Yeah. He's, he's a fascinating character. Yeah. He, he portrays himself in the film Twister, At which I have not <laughs> seen. I have not oh, seen, okay. but now I want to see it just because of that. Yeah. It's, it's pretty great. Uh, I, is Twister actually good? No. Yeah, I, I don't think it... No. I think it would be a hard be a hard sell at the little house. So, hey, honey, can we watch... Don't see Twister. <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman is in Twister. Really? Yeah. As a storm chaser? As a... Yeah, the crazy storm chaser guy with the, with the, the like, DIY uh, storm chasing truck. If I'm a, remembering this. Probably. I have a surprise for you. You ready? It's been a while. Uh, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Do you recognize um, this? Oh. And scroll down. Okay, I'm looking at... I have handed Sam my laptop. I'm looking at uh, screenshots of my writing. Uh, Is it your writing? Can you confirm it's your writing? That's absolutely my writing. I have very, very distinctive uh, handwriting, and that's it. Okay, so hand it back to me. Do you have any idea what that is other than your writing? Like where it's from? My first thought when I see that this is giving me like chills down my spine right now. My first thought when I see that is after my 
it was my first or my second trip to Oklahoma City back in 2012. I lost my notebook. That's it. Someone has my notebook and didn't give it back. Uh, so so the story. I just I just learned of this m- mere hours ago. I thought I must have dropped it, you know, in a in the garbage or on in the airport because certainly, if this were left in the Thunder's practice facility. I'm sort of freaked out about wasn't this. in a thunder's practice facility. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Would would have led to it being returned to me. Now, is your name anywhere in this notebook? Do you think? Oh, maybe not. So here's what happened. Okay, I'm texting with a, a couple people yeah. about who's coming on my podcast, and and I'm texting with someone who we're talking about basketball and the thunder and this book that you've written. Um, and all of a sudden, these screenshots appear in my phone, and and it turns out. A friend of a friend, a friend of a friend of a friend, four, probably four friends away now, okay. four degrees of friendship, found this notebook in the seat compartment of an airplane what? flying somewhere in the world, took it what? and noticed all of these notes about the Oklahoma City Thunder, like a thobocephalosia, and you have a bunch of words, and just has it. Because the, the, no one knew what to do with it, or where, and it looks to be very early on in your reporting yeah, process yeah, yeah. for the book. It was the so, first notebook. So your notebook is exists wow. in the world. Would you like it back? I want it back. I think we can probably arrange that. I want to know what I wrote, and this has haunted me since then. I actually have never told a single person that I lost it because it felt so unprofessional to lose it. I've never lost a reporting notebook before. It's one of these little ones like this that like you have. In front uh, of you it's, right a, it's a different kind, it looks but bigger yeah, similar. Than that. Okay, yeah, similar. And, um, you know, I, I don't even remember what I would have written. I certainly would have written, like, it would have been my most honest thoughts about everything going on there. There would have been a lot in there about, like, the weird paranoia of being inside the Thunder universe at that time, their distrust of the media. And, yeah, I, I always felt horrible that I lost that. And I was worried that someone would be reading it. Steal That's a book of steal so... your book ideas. It's, it was sitting in the seat. You put it in, what? you know, the, you know, those compartments and the, some, somebody found it on an airplane. Hold on. I put it right. I'm flying home from my reporting trip. I'm looking at my notebook. I'm jotting notes to myself. I put it in the seat compartment. I get off the plane because I landed in New York. The plane is swept and nobody finds it. So it goes back to Oklahoma Look, City. I have, I don't know where it is. I don't know if it ever went back to Oklahoma City. What is happening I, I don't know, right now? I don't know where it is. I just can tell you that it's been, it exists. I don't know the whole, I haven't confirmed all the traces of this notebook. I feel like I'm on a prank show or something. No, you're not. Um, bo- the book is called Boomtown. I, I can hear, I can hear people saying, because writing a book that is both about the history of a city and a region and a basketball team is, a very obvious challenge of meshing two disparate but related subject matters. And I can I can hear people saying, well, does it work? Are the history sections going to be readable? And I'm here to tell you, yes. And you brought up Clara Looper. Clara Looper is, is the civil rights hero of the book. And you're absolutely right. I, I specialized in partly in that period of history when I was mm. getting my master's degree and then had a toe in a PhD program before fleeing. I had not heard of Clara Looper. And I read this whole book. I read every section about her thinking, it is shameful that I have not heard this name Hmm. or about these sit-ins. And there are 15 characters like this in the book, all of whom have exactly the right amount of time uh, devoted to them. If you're a reader that maybe comes in this from a basketball first, history second perspective, and you're thinking, I don't need to know that much about that. You get the perfect dose of everyone. They're all super interesting. They're all brilliantly drawn. The history is fascinating. It will suck you in. It's an awesome book. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And it's an enormous challenge. I mean that to mesh those two things. I bet there were times when you wrote it when you're like, this is just too daunting. It's not going to work. Yeah, it was hard. It was, um, I'm not the kind of writer who sits down and plans things out. It has a very, um, complex. I, I want it to be easy to read, but have also this complex structure that kind of knits together into the end of something really, really powerful, more powerful than any of its component parts, which I, I feel like we successfully managed to do. My, editor kevin was very brilliant at helping me do that um but yeah i'm super proud of it and i feel like the basketball i try to write about for people who love basketball and understand every facet of it like you but also for people who don't know the first thing about it it's just like an interesting cultural thing that humans do and and all of all the material in the book is supposed to operate on that level it's just supposed to be a rip and yarn no matter what your interests are coming into it 
Well, you succeeded. Um, and I can t- actually, I think one of the most valuable things in is when someone, f- and this is for any subject matter, with uh, who is not an insider in that world comes to write about that world, that person is going to notice things that the insiders either don't notice or just take for granted. It's like, this is just a thing. Whereas sometimes outsiders will say, well, why is that a thing? What other things could it be? And I think that comes across, that that perspective comes across in your thinking about the team and the thunder and why they work and why they don't work and why they eventually sort of dissolve is I, I do think you notice things that either insiders might overlook or just miss. So I, th- I think the basketball part, even for diehards, is super valuable. Anyway, Thanks. the book is called Boomtown, the fantastical saga of Oklahoma City. It's chaotic founding. It's apocalyptic weather. It's Pearl Wind basketball team, which you do get into the Seattle stuff, oh, we'll man. just call it, yeah. um, and the dream of becoming a world-class metropolis. It's awesome. I, it's really awesome, and I, I just – I. Give it my highest recommendation. People should go read it. Sam Anderson, thank you, sir. Now out in paperback. In paperback. It's in paperback. That's yeah. right. Paperback. So you don't, it's even lighter in your bag. You won't get, uh, you won't get chastised as I did by packing it in a suitcase on a long vacation because it's, it's, it's hardback books are heavy. Sam, thank you so much for your time, man. The book is great. Thank you. 